Welcome everyone to our weekly Q&A with Toronto's Associate Medical Officer of Health, Dr. Vanita Dubey. Thank you so much for joining us again this week. Yeah, thanks for having me. Absolutely. My name is Dilshad Berman. I am a writer and reporter with City N680 News, and I will be moderating this chat today. The way it goes is we have been collecting your questions over the past few days, and we'll be presenting them to the doctor. She's never seen them before. This is all off the cuff. I have a cache of questions with me here, but if you haven't had a chance to submit your questions, you can still do so under this live broadcast, and we'll try to get to as many live questions and submitted questions as we can in this short 30-minute period that we have with the doctor today. So, doctor, are you ready to go? Yeah, I'm ready. I'm just wondering if your record is on. Recording. But yes, thank you. <laughs> All right. Yeah, recording now. Thank you so much, doctor. Okay. Um, so here we go. What we're going to do is we're going to start with a vaccine questions because that's top of mind for everybody. You know, we've got tons of people vaccinated in Toronto, but people still have lots of questions. So we'll start with our cache of vaccine questions. And then if you have any other questions, you can still submit them and we'll try and get to them. Um, so here we go. Let's start with Rob, doctor. Um, Rob asks, are we tracking breakthrough cases in the province and the city of people who are deemed to be fully vaccinated or people who have one dose but are still catching COVID? Yes, so, so there are a number of different ways in which that is being uh, captured. In fact, one of the best analysis so far has been something that was put out two weeks ago now by Public Health Ontario that showed that out of three and a half million people who were vaccinated uh, until April, 0.06% got COVID. Um, and most of those people who got COVID got it within the first two weeks when we know the vaccine is it does not give you that protection. So yeah, it's going to be really important to keep watching that to going forward. The people who are vaccinated and get COVID, are they getting a variant, a different variant? Are they ending up in hospital? That is really important to, to, to keep track of. Absolutely, right. Um, and then uh, Lynn asks, um, recently, Nancy stated that the second dose vaccines should remain consistent with the first dose, um, and there's some potential for variation when it comes to the AstraZeneca second dose if it's not available. Um, so in this situation, they say that Nancy said to use the Johnson & Just Johnson vaccine, and they have two questions based on that. One, that J&J is a single dose vaccine, so how can it be mixed with the two dose protocol? Um, and then secondly, how can it be recommended in Canada when J&J has not been released yet in Canada? I'm confused by this recommendation and thank you for any clarity. Okay, yeah. So the recommendation that NASI has is the same recommendation that it has had, that um, you know, as much as possible, whatever you have for your first dose, get that for your second dose. That's where we have the evidence. If you, if what you had for your first dose, you can't get it for your second dose, try and get the sister vaccine, the same type of vaccine. Right. So a messenger RNA vaccine, so Pfizer and Moderna would be considered, or a viral vector vaccine, that's AstraZeneca or Janssen. Okay. And so they just clarified that existing recommendation. So if you got one dose of AstraZeneca, the same vaccine in that same family is right. the Johnson & Johnson vaccine. And so you would get one dose of that. One dose of Johnson is actually a full series, and so you would be done. So it was just clarifying that recommendation. Now, you're absolutely right. We don't have any Johnson & Johnson vaccine available right now. Right. And so if you can't get AstraZeneca for your second dose, or you don't want AstraZeneca for your second dose, then what you're left doing is waiting, because NACI will be providing guidance on these mixed dosing schedules that should be coming out within the next little bit okay okay but currently they did say that we're going to stick with the same kind of vaccine at least because for right now that's all the evidence that we have but we're expecting to get more evidence to be able to provide guidance for those mixed schedules yes right okay perfect um and we actually have a, a few live questions coming in already so let's go to those um rowena asks if someone has had bell's palsy in the past and had signs of bell's palsy after the first moderna shot should they get the second shot okay so good question so i mean bell's palsy was one of those signals that was identified in the clinical trials but didn't seem to be more cases of bell's palsy related to vaccinations but that's something that's be, be, being kept a close eye on 
Bell's palsy can actually be quite common. And so the question is, are people getting Bell's palsy because they're getting Bell's palsy or are they getting it from the vaccine? It doesn't seem to be related to the vaccine. So I think what the best thing for you to do is to have a conversation with your doctor if you've had a flare up of your Bell's palsy palsy following vaccination, um, have a conversation with your doctor on either what you can do. Are there medications you can take? Is there an interval in terms of vaccination? Are you recommended to get a, a different type of vaccine, for example? Okay. Um, and then uh, Helen asks, um, taking the second AstraZeneca shot, is there any data if there is a risk of blood clots after the second shot? And how many days after is that sort of risk period? Okay, so those rare blood clots with the AstraZeneca and actually the Johnson & Johnson vaccine are still present with uh, the second dose of the AstraZeneca. There certainly have been cases reported. Right now in the UK, it looks like the rate is about one in 600,000. It's hard to know if that's actually the final rate. We saw with the first dose that originally it was seen to be very rare and then became, um, as we got more and more cases, could actually determine that the rate was about one in 50,000. So yes, that rare blood clot can occur following the second dose. It seems to be occurring less commonly uh, than with the first dose. And doctor, what is the time period to watch out for? Because I know for the first shot, you said it was 28 days, right? Yeah, so for, uh, four days after the vaccination to 28 days. So about within the month at following vaccination, that's when you should watch for symptoms. Uh, when you're past that period, the it, um, you're, you're actually in the clear. Okay, okay, perfect. Um, and then uh, Lillian asks, after I get the second shot, can I take off my mask? Uh, after you get the second shot, you cannot, uh, uh, I mean, you're still recommended to continue with public health measures. You have to realize that um, our case rates in Ontario, while they're coming down very nicely, they are still high. I mean, today we're between three and 400 cases a day in our city alone. Yes. So we still need to see the case rates come down substantially more. Um, there aren't a lot of people that actually have two doses, and there are now starting to be more recommendations for if you have two doses, what what can change. And so one recent one that's just come out is if you have two doses and you're exposed to someone who has COVID, you don't have to, to go in self-isolation for 14 days. You just have to watch for symptoms. So right. I think more and more guidance will come out uh, in, in the future. Right, right. And that's, that's a good one to know that if you've got both your shots, you don't necessarily have to go into isolation. That's a big deal. That is a big deal. Yeah. Yeah. yeah because re till recently, if you were exposed, you had to, you know, you and anybody you were exposing had to, had to isolate. So that's a big deal for sure. Um, let's, uh, sorry, there's more live questions coming in here. So let's quickly get to those. Um, uh, Josie asks, if someone was tested positive for COVID, uh, do they still need the vaccine? It's still recommended that you get the vaccine. The COVID that you had may not protect you against variants, for example. Right. The COVID that you had may not, may not also give you that longer term immunity. It might just last for 30 days, mm -hmm. sorry, for 90 days. Some people have gotten COVID more than once. So mm -hmm. it's still recommended that you get vaccinated and you get the full series. So if that's two doses, that you get the two doses. Right, right. Um, and then I guess it's a provincial question, but uh, Leanne asks, is Ontario at the 60% that is required to go into phase one of reopening? Uh, so it looks like Ontario is doing uh, well. Yes, uh, the vaccinations in adults uh, is very good. Um, you have to remember, though, that from when you're vaccinated, it takes two weeks for the vaccines to give you that protection. Right. And so if we're at 60 percent today, you you know, some the people that were recently vaccinated will not have their full protection from that dose mm -hmm. until two weeks afterwards. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Um, OK, and then. Uh, Mary asks, my hospital didn't give me a second appointment. Do I need to call them? I got my Pfizer vaccine in April. This is a common question with the second dose appointments. Yeah, so I think there's more that's going to come out shortly on second dose appointments. Um, we know that pharmacies have more vaccine, for example, hopefully primary care offices will get more vaccine. So there may be other ways to be able to get those second doses um, as well in the future. Um, but um, the place where you got your vaccine 
a, a point where you got your first dose, they are the ones that will give you information on booking your second dose. And yes, yeah, so if you got a vaccine at a pop-up clinic, for example, through a hospital clinic, at, uh, through the pop-up, then they will make plans to go back to the community for second doses. Uh, so more, again, will be coming out on that in terms of um, how, how to be able to make sure that you get your second dose. No one is going to go beyond the four months for that second dose for sure. And, and we're seeing now with AstraZeneca, you know, like people who got the first dose and want the second dose, there are some that can actually go back to pharmacies and get that second dose. And so that, you know, mechanism is there for one vaccine and maybe there for others in the future. Yes, currently, I believe if you got your first shot of AstraZeneca between March 10th and 19th, you can now book your second shot. So, so people That's are... right. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Perfect. Okay. Um, okay. And then Cecilia asks, uh, when are younger kids getting vaccinated? I have uh, two grandkids, three and seven, um, and all kids of all ages should be getting their vaccines before sending them back, I'm assuming, back to school. Yeah, so right now we have the Pfizer vaccine that's licensed for 12 years and older. We don't have a vaccine that's licensed for younger than 12 years of age, though there are studies that are ongoing for that. So we'll have to wait to have a vaccine that's licensed for the younger age groups. Right, absolutely. Um, and then we just spoke about AstraZeneca. So we have one of the submitted questions over the week. Elena asks, um, what is the efficacy of AstraZeneca after? after a second dose at 10 weeks instead of waiting the full recommended 12 weeks because we are uh, I believe accelerating some second doses so that we can use up the stockpile that we have of vaccines. Yeah so we know that uh if you give AstraZeneca at 12 weeks compared to, you know, uh, four weeks, you get a better response with that second dose. Uh, is there a difference between 10 weeks and 12 weeks? We don't really have that data to be able to say, oh, 12 weeks is a magic number. I think what we know with vaccine science principles is when you have a, 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 an interval between your first and your second dose, by the time you get your second dose, it gives you a chance to get that booster response. And so the difference between 10 and 12 weeks, I, we don't have data for that. It's probably likely to be very similar, mm -hmm. but uh, I, I don't have any concrete numbers to share on that. Right, right. Um, and then Mahanaz asks, uh, I have my two doses of Pfizer vaccine and I'm six weeks out. Um, if I travel to Canada, do I still need to quarantine after being fully vaccinated? Yes, you are. You, you are required to quarantine. Those uh, laws are federal laws. They're from the Public Health Agency of Canada. And we have not seen them provide any guidance for people who travel who have two doses. Okay. Um, and then uh, another live question coming in here. Uh, Denise says, um, I was COVID positive uh, on May 1st. When can I take the vaccine? Okay, Denise. Well, I'm sorry that you got COVID, but as long as you're no longer in self-isolation, you've been cleared by public health, then you can book your appointment anytime for, for your COVID vaccine. Okay. Um, and let's go back to our submitted questions here. Um, Sarah says, again, we're talking about kindergarten age children, and you just mentioned that we have to wait for vaccines to be um, uh, approved for, for children. But in the meantime, will it be safe to meet with other family members who are vaccinated if the kids aren't vaccinated? Yeah, so we don't quite have that kind of granular uh, guidelines yet. I mean, right now, the, the guidance is you can meet outdoors with up to five other people, but keep a physical distance and wear a mask. And so that's the recommendation that I would say for right now. Right. Uh, and then uh, Rosalie asks, this is interesting. Rosalie says, I had my AstraZeneca vaccine in April and two days after it, I had severe eye pain and developed a black area in the center of my vision. It, it did go away. I would prefer not to get the AstraZeneca vaccine again. It may not have been related as I have retinal inflammation anyway, but I would prefer to get an mRNA vaccine as my second dose. What do you think? What are your recommendations? Just wait. Uh, the, the guidance will be coming on that. We, we don't have enough AstraZeneca for everyone who had AstraZeneca for their yeah. first dose to get it for the second. Um, and so just, you know, in the next little bit, I can't give you a concrete time or date, but there will be guidance on, you know, whether you could, uh, I mean, you could, what the recommendation is for a messenger RNA vaccine, for example. Yeah, absolutely. Um, 
And then uh, Ben asks, there are reports that some youths receiving Pfizer have developed heart inflammation within four days of receiving their vaccine. There are also some fatalities in Israel. Shouldn't parents be made aware of these findings and included in the consent forms that they have to sign for the kids? Okay, so good question. So what we found is that there's been a cluster of um, reports of my, uh, myocarditis related uh, in Israel among young men uh, following mostly their second dose of vaccination. And also, as I understand in the US among um, some military uh, personnel, again, males following the second dose of vaccination. This is under active investigation. Myocarditis does occur. I mean, it's not a rare uh, instance and it does uh, can occur in uh, young adults as well. And so what we have, what the investigations are doing is looking at, well, how much myocarditis do we normally have? Mm -hmm. um, and are we seeing that, that those rates are higher now, especially among those who are vaccinated? And my understanding is that right now there's been no link to suggest that we're seeing more cases of myocarditis, especially in those who are vaccinated. And so it's being closely monitored, very closely monitored, um, but it is not, uh, uh, related to the vaccine um, based on the investigations to date. Uh, and again, um, the, the, the situations where it, they, it has been noted has mostly been following the second dose and not in youth, uh, more in young, young adults. And doctor, what are the symptoms that one should watch for when it comes to myocarditis? It's mostly related to chest pain, chest tightness, trouble breathing. You could uh, sometimes have symptoms of, of an infection that causes the myocarditis as well too. So I think this is the kind of thing where when we give millions of doses of vaccine, we can identify um, uh, um, might be clusters or whatever. And so what we need to do is to investigate to be able to see if it's caused by the vaccine. Um, and so there no links have been identified. We have to realize that for the, the messenger RNA vaccines, even that many more millions of doses have been given around the world compared to even AstraZeneca. Uh, you know, in the US, uh, 140 million doses of Pfizer or more have already been given, 3 million in youth. And, um, you know, it, that, that hasn't been um, identified or characterized as uh, related to the vaccine, but is being closely monitored. Um, and then we have another live question coming in. I don't know if we have the answer to this, uh, but Tazim asks, what are the results in mixing AstraZeneca as a first dose and Pfizer as a second dose? So the results that we have right now that have been published are related to the side effects that you get. And we know that if you have AstraZeneca first and then Pfizer second, you might get a, a sore arm than if you had AstraZeneca, AstraZeneca, for example. You might get more of a fever. You might get more of a headache. Um, and so you might have slightly more side effects. That's yeah. really all we know right now. Some people say, well, if you have more side effects, that probably means the vaccine's working, but we don't actually have that data yet to show right. that um, it, it works. Um, and we're expecting that uh, very shortly. Right, right. It's all in the works. I think there's so much new information that's still to come out, right? Yeah. Uh, and okay, Wings asks, um, if you become fully vaccinated, for example, with AstraZeneca, should you get fully vaccinated with Pfizer and Moderna again in the fall? because the two use different technologies? Or should the third booster shot be the same as the first that you took? So if it was AstraZeneca, then you take a third booster shot of AstraZeneca. So right now, once you've completed your vaccine series, uh, and so that means two, two doses for AstraZeneca, Pfizer, or Moderna, you're considered up to date. And there is no recommendation for a third dose. There's also no recommendation to have a whole brand new series of a different type of vaccine. Yes. Um, okay, and then another question regarding the uh, second appointments here. Uh, Caitlin asks, I received my first dose at, at a pop-up, and the pop-up provider is saying that they're awaiting government direction on second shots before booking back appointments, um, but the ministry says that you're supposed to book your second shot when you get your first shot. So what is going on? When will I get my second appointment? 
Okay, so yeah, so it, sorry for the mixed messaging. The The answer here is that if you book through the provincial booking system, which is mostly online or by phone, then you're automatically booked for a second dose. Mm -hmm. But if you have get vaccinated at a pharmacy or through a pop-up clinic, uh, a mobile clinic, um, then your second dose is not automatically booked, but is kind of in the queue for where they, whoever gave you your first dose to give you the second dose. And so right now those second doses are occurring at 16 weeks. But remember, we've talked about before that we have that extended interval because we had vaccine shortages. Yeah. But if we actually have enough supply, we can actually shorten that interval. And so um, maybe it could be that you get your second dose at, 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 I don't know, 12 weeks instead of 16 weeks or whatever it might be, in which case uh, you'll, you'll be notified uh, at that time. Right. I think a lot of people who are getting their vaccines at pop ups are worried that there's nobody tracking it or there's no no record in the system and they won't be contacted for second shots. But as you've mentioned before, like everybody goes into the COVAX system of the province, right? That's right. And actually, I just found out about a really great feature that regardless of where you got vaccinated, your vaccine information goes into this provincial registry called COVAX. And so you can actually go onto the provincial booking system website, put in your health card number, and then it can and then there's a, a field that you can pick that says, uh, get a record of your vaccination. And so you can actually then show, see that the, the receipt that you get after your vaccination means that your vaccine has gone into the COVAX system. Right, right, absolutely. And so there is, you're definitely being tracked. Somebody hopefully will contact you when, when it's time to get your second shot. That's right. Um, okay, and then we've got Okay. Nancy asks, this is about AstraZeneca, is there any guarantee that there eventually will be a sufficient supply of AstraZeneca to provide second doses for everybody who wants it? If supply is uncertain and some of us don't want to mix and match, are there any other options under consideration? So I, I think that the, the various levels of government are working on getting more AstraZeneca, absolutely. So I, I don't think that it's, you know, once these, this supply is done, that there won't be any more to come. So, um, so hang tight. <laughs> no, my understanding is that there's, uh, I think the number was 300,000 more doses are on the way. I just don't know the timeline personally, but we do have that information on our website. If you want to check out citynews.ca, we've got some information regarding AstraZeneca and the next shipments that are coming in. Um, okay, and then let's go back to uh, some more submitted questions here. Um, Carly has an interesting one. Uh, why are dentists who perform aerosol generating procedures not included in the high risk healthcare workers category? They should have their second vaccine date moved up. Okay, so uh, it was actually the provincial government that came out with defining healthcare workers who would be getting their second dose at an earlier interval if they didn't already get it. Um, and so again, though, as we have more and more vaccine, we'll be able to shorten that interval for many more people, including uh, other types of healthcare workers. I think it's important to know that even healthcare workers, whatever job you have, one dose provides still good protection. Uh, Ontario data shows the 70% uh, protection. Um, and then you're still wearing your PPE. Um, and so that's, you know, going to give you, again, that protection that, gave, uh, that we had all the way through this pandemic. Yes, yes, absolutely. And I mean, I, we've talked about this before when it comes to emergency workers, when it comes to uh, dentists, things like that, the levels of PPE are much higher than just a mask and gloves. Like it's proper PPE, you're wearing a gown, you're wearing shield, et cetera, et cetera, in order to protect you in general. Yeah, it's essentially that eye protection and that mask is, is going to be some of the most, the biggest protection. Plus, you're screening your patients that come in to make sure they don't have symptoms. I mean, there's a lot of other things that we do to prevent the spread of COVID in those settings as well. Absolutely. Um, and then uh, this is actually, um, two people have a similar question. Uh, I have food allergies and need to carry an EpiPen in my daily life. And I'm very worried and concerned about getting the COVID-19 vaccine. Um, should I be getting an allergy test before I get the shot? Is the shot safe for me? So if all you have is food allergies uh, and it's, you know, foods like, you know, shellfish or eggs or whatever it is, that's, you're okay to get the vaccine. 
if you're particularly concerned, you could stay at the clinic for 30 minutes. Again, most people who have reactions get the reactions within the first 15 minutes. Mm -hmm. what, the, what you need to do is to, to see an allergist is if you have an actual allergy to one of the ingredients in the vaccine. And so that means polyethylene glycol, which is PEG, which is you know common in colonoscopy preps and laxatives. That's in the Pfizer and the Moderna vaccine. Tromethamine, which is a, a, a dye that's used in CT scan and MRI scans, and that's in the Moderna vaccine. And then, well, the AstraZeneca, we're not giving first doses anyway. So it's really those ingredients that if you have an allergy for that, you should really see, see an allergist. But if it's just in general food allergies, um, you could talk to your doctor. Maybe your doctor might recommend that you take a medication before you get vaccinated. Um, but it, you, it, you are not considered contraindicated from getting the vaccine. Um, we have a few more minutes, so let's keep going here. Um, Anonymous asks, my daughter's second Pfizer shot is due in early August, and she will be working at a sleepover summer camp on that day. Um, they, the staff and campers are going to be in a bubble, and they can't leave the camp. So is there any loss of effectivity if she gets her second shot at week 18 with the Pfizer vaccine? Um, or is it possible that she can get it in late June before she leaves? So move up her shot. Okay, so getting your vaccine later, like after the four months, it's fine. You would still just continue to get the second dose when you get it and you would be completed. You wouldn't have to restart the series or anything. Again, you know, based on supply, if we end up getting tens and tens of vaccine and can shorten the interval for, for everyone, then that may be a possibility. Whether it will be bumped as early as June, I can't, I, I can't comment on that. But I yeah. think what I can safely say is getting it afterwards uh, would be uh, would be safe, would be fine, would still give you good protection. Okay, okay, perfect. Um, and then, okay, uh, S. McDowell asks, um, I had the Moderna vaccine five weeks ago. Uh, the next day I broke out in a severe rash and hives in my underarms and my groin. I normally take reactant daily and my doctor and pharmacist said that that would do the trick, but it didn't. Um, they had to upgrade the medication up to antibiotics, um, and then it finally cleared um, in two weeks or so. The question is, should I get the second dose of the Moderna vaccine if I had this kind of reaction? Yeah, I think that's a good question. I think that's a question, though, that you're going to have to ask your, your doctor about. Often you can get a referral to an allergist who can help to decide whether it's what you had was an allergic reaction to the vaccine and whether getting... Um, a different vaccine might be recommended. Um, so I, I would definitely recommend that. Okay. okay. Uh, and then, so this is interesting because we've got this question several times regarding uh, approval of the vaccines. Um, Hannah and another person asked a similar question. I noticed those who are hesitant about the mRNA vaccine often say that they don't want to take it because it's only authorized for emergency use and not fully approved. What would you say to them? Okay, well, I think the important point to know is the interim order that we have for approving these vaccines does not mean that any corners were cut in terms of the approval, the approvals. And so often the way we explain it is um, you have to do three types of clinical trials, phase one, phase two, phase three. And those three uh, clinical trials were still done despite the emergency approval. It's just they were done at the same time. And so that way the results came about at the same time. And that could fast track the assessment of the trial results and the approval. But no steps were missed or skipped out. Um, we think we also have to recognize that we're in the midst of this pandemic and COVID is a very real risk. Mm -hmm. And so we have to recognize that if we decide not to get the vaccine, we could still get COVID and get very sick from COVID ourselves and also spread it to others, uh, especially our loved ones. Right, absolutely. Um, and then, okay, uh, if I get the vaccine, can I still transmit the virus? And if I get the vaccine, do I still have to bear, wear a mask? Um, and can the virus still harm me? So if you get the vaccine, you're less likely to transmit the virus. 
uh, so that's good. If, however, you, you get the vaccine and you ended up getting COVID, um, which can happen, it's not very common, but it certainly can happen, you're less likely to get a more severe case of COVID. You're less likely to be hospitalized. If you got COVID in that situation, you could probably uh, still spread it to those. So that's the situation in which you might be able to spread it. And so that's why while our COVID case rates are still continue to be high in the province, we have to continue with masking and distancing and staying at home right. until we can get those rates lower and more people vaccinated with one dose and even more with the two doses eventually. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, okay, so we are at the end of our um, uh, of our vaccine questions for now. If you still have vaccine questions, you can still submit them, but I'm going to move on to some other questions that we have here. Um, uh, Liam asks, if most of the seniors are vaccinated uh, and long-term homes are now kind of taken care of, what are uh, the what what age are the approximately thirty people that we are still seeing, you know, dying every day? So, so yeah, I mean, the age it's actually all different age ranges. Um, some long-term care homes, the residents have very good vaccination rates, but sometimes the staff don't, or there are still staff that are not vaccinated who can bring it into the home. Um, and again, the vaccines are not 100%. You could still get COVID. You're more likely to get a milder case, but that is still a, a possibility. Um, and so we are seeing with this third wave and with the variants that it is younger compared to previous waves, people who are getting sick and getting very sick uh, from, from this infection. Right. And we have one minute left, so I'll just squeeze in this, uh, this question from Miss J. Uh, Miss J asks, my class would like to know if you can get COVID if you're inside a TTC bus, uh, what is the likelihood? Okay, so COVID is spread mostly from close contact with um, someone else. It can be spread through droplets or through the aerosols. That's when the droplets then are stay in the air for a bit longer and can spread that way. And so in a TTC bus, if, if you can keep a physical distance, it's less likely to spread. People, everyone is wearing a mask. If the windows are open, again, that's ventilation, less likely to spread. So some of it depends on the circumstance. First of all, is there someone on the bus who's right next to you who's contagious at that time? Hmm. People who have symptoms really shouldn't be taking the transit. Are you wearing a mask? Are they wearing a mask? Are you keeping a physical distance? So it's really not just about the bus. It's actually about all the scenarios where we're at and how well we can keep a physical distance and follow those other precautions. Right, absolutely. So that brings us to one o'clock. Thank you, doctors, so much for joining us again this week and answering all these questions. Thank you to everybody that participated and sent in your live questions. If we couldn't get to your question, I do apologize, but we will have the doctor back with us next week again on Wednesday. Um, and so we'll ask them then. Thank you so much, doctor. Okay, bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thanks, everyone.